Hello everyone and welcome to this Britannica webinar. It's lovely to see so many of you and uh, we're going to spend the next hour um, talking about creativity in the age of change and why creativity now is as important uh, as ever, if not more important than ever before. So who am I? A little bit of background. Uh, my name is uh, Mike Gibson uh, and I'm a creative director. I've worked in advertising for many years in Russia and I've worked on many big brands including Procter & Gamble, uh, Lada, Mars, Visa and many others. It's been a very exciting ride. I've been working in advertising here for about uh, 20 years. I also teach at the British uh, Higher School of Art and Design on the marketing course uh, and uh, it's with my marketing hat on that I'm going to talk to you about uh, the way the world is changing and we need to be creative in order to address uh, those changes. So the, today the uh, talk is going to be kind of in four sections. I'm going to talk to you first of all about the way uh, the world is changing and the way that in fact change itself has changed. And then Part two, we're going to say, talk about how does uh, creative help? What role does it play? Of course, it's very important that creativity is not just for fun, but actually there is a hard business case for it. So in the third section, we talk about the economic case for creativity. And then in section four, how can I be more creative? Or how can you be more creative? What tools can we use? How can I learn to apply this in uh, my approach? my life and my work. So here we are, section one, change, change. And change really has changed. If we look at the way that things uh, rolled out uh, throughout history, we'll see that the telephone when it was introduced took about 60 years in order for it to uh, thoroughly penetrate society. It took uh, computers and um, mobile phones, uh, well, it's 35 years to get uh, properly integrated, and the, mo the smartphone took much less, five years. So you can see each new innovation has become gradually and gradually much quicker. So time, we think that time has changed. We think that six months is the new five years. Things happen very, very fast now, uh, and we can't afford to lag behind. There's a great... Um, Quotation, uh, I'm sure you all uh, read Russian each time, Shtova, Vishtiashi, Piat Liet, after we were promiscuous, it needs a bullshit chem as a person, a pretty yeah. So, uh, Mary Ivan, who's the CEO of GM, basically saying that uh, they think in the next five years um, the, uh, the production of most cars is going to change as much as in the last 50. So, things are really motoring, they're moving quickly. And we have to be able to work with that change. We have to be able to adapt, we have to be flexible. Um, and what's interesting to note, you've all heard about IQ, which is uh, the intelligence quota. Um, you've all heard probably about EQ, which is the emotional uh, quotient. And that's something that came up uh, recently in the last um, sort of decade, really, more and more conversation about EQ. And then very recently, a new uh, quotient has kind of appeared called AQ, which is adaptability quotient. Now you may think that that's some sort of joke, um, some new fad or some new sort of phraseology, which doesn't mean much, but actually it's quite serious. Um, and if you look at big people like IBM, actually they consider uh, the uh, adaptability quotient as one of the most important things they're looking for uh, in people um, who come to work for them. And in fact, uh, last year, um, they were looking for people who were willing and flexible and adaptable to change. And this is one of their most uh, critical skills that they look for uh, in workers. It was in fourth position in 2016, and then in 2019, it was basically top of the list. So you can see how people like IBM recognize the fact that the world is changing fast, so fast, that people that work for them have to be able to cope 
uh, with that change. And in some ways, it's not surprising, really. Um, go back to Darwin. He sort of, he sort of said that over a you know, hundred years ago. It's not the strongest who survive, nor the most intelligent, but the ones who adapt to change. So really, in a way, there's nothing new in that. Um, but somehow it's now become more evident and more crucial than ever before. Um, and there are various other things that, that are changing. The ways our lives should be led, um, the way we uh, do education is going to change. A survey from the United States um, stated that children born in 2007 uh, in Italy, France, Canada and the USA are expected to live to 104, which is amazing. So people who today are 13 are expected to live to over 100. That's an incredible change. As a result, the way we get educated is going to change. Classically, people think of going to university from sort of 19 to 24 for uh, further education, but it's not going to be like that in the future. Basically, there are going to be multiple education points and different professional cycles. So you will get a first degree, I guess many of you are at that stage now, um, and then midlife, sort of 35, you go and have another dose of education, and then in 55, again, another education period. So interestingly, I still have one education moment still ahead of me. Very different from the way um, I perceived going to university when I went uh, to university sort of 20 years ago, now, where I thought it was just once and it's a job, one job for life. But that's all very much uh, changed. Um, and what's also interesting is that 60% uh, of kids today will be doing jobs that do not yet exist, right? Fascinating. But in some ways, that's not surprising because 10 years ago, um, there were professions today that did not exist back then. Um, at least 10 professions uh, didn't uh, exist uh, that are now among the most popular and highly paid. Think of big data specialists or app developers or drone operators. And we can see that tendency carrying on. 50% of kids in jobs that do not yet exist. Now it's very interesting uh, where we see um, on the way, particularly in marketing, uh, that brands are changing uh, very fast. In 2018 at the Cannes Advertising Festival in France, it's a very important festival and it's a big indicator of trends and the way the market is behaving. In 2018, they uh, give out prizes for the best uh, work, the best campaigns. Um, and of the Grand Prix, there were uh, 30, um, uh, 29 Grand Prix, uh, there were 16 given out for social uh, type advertising campaigns and 13 for commercial type advertising campaigns. So what I'm saying here is that brands that have got purpose or um, have a social uh, agenda to them uh, were given 16 of the Grand Prix and 13 went to commercial. That was in 2018. Come 2019, that number has changed radically. We now got 22 uh, getting social uh, prizes for social campaigns and eight for commercial. So there's a big tendency for brands to be taking uh, social issues much more seriously. Things to do with the environment, uh, to do with sustainability, uh, to do with welfare, um, minority groups, uh, feminism, etc., etc. This has become a much, much bigger topic. Um, and that is a huge change just in one year. Um, What's interesting is that uh, consumers around the world uh, are very much behind those figures that I just showed you on the previous slide. 64% of consumers around the world will buy or boycott a brand solely because of its position on a social or political issue, which is a, a staggering increase of 13 points from last year. So this is actually a statistic from 2018 and the increase is from 2017. Um, but you can see 64% of consumers, that is a big, big number, um, 
and they're looking to see that their brands are basically behaving properly uh, and have uh, a, a sort of a social um, uh, cause and are socially uh, responsible. Um, and again, changing very, very fast. 13% in one year is massive. Um, and I want to show you a campaign now by, by, from Nike, um, which is very interesting about one of their guys, one of their sportsmen who they sponsored called uh, Colin uh, Kaepernick. Kaepernick. Um, and uh, he played um, uh, American uh, uh, football and he was one of the sponsored uh, uh, figures of Nike. He appeared in their advertising campaign. And at one point before one of the games, he decided that he would not stand for the American national anthem. And this caused an enormous scandal um, because it's assumed that everyone should really stand for the national anthem. But he decided he wouldn't. And it's perfect within his rights. He's free to do so. Uh, in the United States, um, they even have uh, the uh, amendment rights, uh, freedom, uh, uh, the right to free speech. So he's actually expressing uh, his um, quintessential characteristics of the kind of the American constitution. Um, and what happened was very interesting. There was uh, a lot of pressure on Knight to basically uh, dump Colin as one of their advertising uh, faces, and uh, Knight decided not to. And that was a big decision. And Knight took a lot of punishment as a brand for doing that. And in the past, most brands do actually just dump uh, their celebrity figures if there's a problem. Uh, they walk away. But Nike decided not to. And by staying with uh, Colin Kaepernick, uh, they, in the end, actually got uh, greater benefit. There's a very interesting case. Um, just watch the film. It explains it in about two minutes. Several people posting videos of burning Nike shoes. Nike is running straight, straight into a political controversy. People are so angry they're burning their own shoes. game of the new season and Nike is running an ad featuring Colin Kaepernick. If people say your dreams are crazy, good. Stay that way. So that's a very, you see a very interesting um, uh, campaign. It's all about dreaming crazy and athletes who basically aspire to do great things despite all the challenges. So in fact, Nike would have been mad if they walked away from the Colin Kaepernick because it was very much in the spirit uh, of the message that they were trying to say. But as a result of staying by him, um, they, uh, as you could see from the video, actually their stock price went up um, after a few very tricky days when it wasn't clear quite which way things would go. Um, now, 
uh, you could see believe in something if it means sacrificing uh, everything. Um, so basically, consumers want to know, are you with me? Yeah, so this is something that, that's changed even more. In the past, a lot of social advertising was kind of um, a little bit hollow, sometimes a bit fake. It would just be brands doing things to look like they were doing them. But now, actually, consumers really want to see uh, that brands are prepared to go the distance uh, and, if necessary, uh, fall on their sword um, for uh, a cause. Um, and interestingly enough, one of uh, uh, an advertising agency in Brazil, uh, one of the directors there made a very interesting comment at a seminar uh, at recently. He said, if your brand is not doing anything to help the world, it will not exist in the next five to 10 years. And this is a thing we're seeing more and more, particularly with Generation Z. Uh, they're very much driven uh, by values. They want brands that uh, take action. Uh, to actually help make the world a better place. So this is a hugely important thing. Interestingly here, another uh, case um, from a big brand, Gillette, from Procter & Gamble. Um, they have, uh, it's a very sort of mainstream brand creating shavers. And they have a brand message, which has always been in the past the best a man can get, which in a way is very much all about, um, you, you know, a guy getting what he wants, going out there, taking things, uh, reigning victorious and necessary roughshod over uh, whatever he has to ride over in order to achieve what he needs to achieve. Um, but actually what Gillette said is actually we need to redefine men uh, a little bit and we need to not have a brand message that says the best a man can get. We need a brand message that says the best men can be, which actually is more about the value of men, about the sorts of things they believe in and uphold, uh, to try and basically encourage uh, better decent behavior from, uh, from men. And it was a very interesting campaign. And what's interesting here is that when Procter Gamble uh, produced this film, like Knight, they suffered. There was a lot of trolling against them, and there seemed to be um, there was a lot of guys took offense. But what was very cool was that Procter & Gamble did not uh, drop the advertising. They stood by their message and said, this is what we believe. And even if we have to suffer for it, we are not going to uh, uh, stop uh, this campaign. Um, you can see a bit more about this in this film. Bullying. The Me Too movement against Perhaps sexual harassment. Masculinity is the best a man can get. Is it? We can't hide from it yet. It's been going on far too long. We can't laugh it off. What I actually making the same old excuses but something finally changed and there will be no going back because we we believe in the best in men men need to hold other men accountable come on to say the right thing, to act the right way. Some already are. In ways big and small. But some is not enough. Some don't treat each other, okay? Because the boys watching today So again, um, we see that basically in the age of uh, Me Too uh, and um, issues like that, 
Um, Procter and Gamble wants to be on the right side of the argument, um, and they're trying to actually speak out against things like bullying, sexual harassment, uh, and the fact that people of the world tend to, to turn a blind eye, particularly in sort of post um, Harvey Weinstein uh, sort of era in America. So here they are, um, and the uh, Procter and Gamble took a lot of um, uh, criticism and trolling. Uh, about this film, and people were saying, you know, guys will be guys, what of it? Um, and Fox and Gamble did not fool the ad, they kept with it uh, to much to their, uh, uh, I think, benefit. And there are many others. We see other types of communication uh, coming out, which is, which is new and sort of indicative of, a, of the way things are changing. Um, and this is a lovely campaign from. Um, uh, from Israel, which was all about um, a, a, a very simple idea, um, which was produced by an advertising campaign in um, Tel Aviv for IKEA. Um, and the idea was to basically uh, to rethink furniture for people who basically um, are not able to use furniture like normal people, but have special demands. Um, and by cleverly designing actually very small extra detail for existing IKEA furniture, it was possible to allow disabled people to also enjoy uh, IKEA furniture more easily. Um, this is a lovely case. Although I have cerebral palsy, I do everything I can to conduct myself like everyone else. But in my own home, I'm surrounded with furniture crying out, cripple. I'd like to sit on a regular sofa. Without being afraid, I won't be able to get up. vision is to create a better everyday life for the many. This enables build simple and affordable home furnishings for 10% of the population. So you, you see, we've seen a few cases now uh, by Nike, Procter and Gamble, and IKEA, showing how society is changing. Now we've got brands who are like not moving away uh, when difficult situations happen. They stand up for things they be, uh, believe in, uh, and are actually trying to um, uh, believe in something and actually act to uh, improve and make the world a better place. Um, an interestingly uh, statistic that came out with that campaign from IKEA, a room with 15 people, uh, diverse people, are more effective thinkers than 150 people of the same. So basically, when you mix people up with uh, different um, race, gender, uh, abilities, you get a much more uh, powerful thinking uh, um, community than you do by just having the same people who reflect each other's uh, uh, thoughts. Um, 
Now, like, what's very interesting, we've seen those three cases, um, and I'm going to skip over this one because we uh, don't have so much time. Um, and what I want to show you is a brand that got it wrong, because sometimes it's very interesting to look at failures, because uh, failures can be uh, as instructive as um, successes. And in this particular case, Pepsi um, had a um, commercial with uh, Kendall Jenner, who's uh, a sort of major face and celebrity. Um, and it was considered to be very fake. Uh, it's quite clear that actually there is no real cause that in fact Pepsi are not doing anything, but just pretending to be um, helping or part of a, a social um, action. Um, this caused a huge scandal when it came out. It was so bad that in fact Pepsi had to apologize. They had to pull the commercial off air. There was a big, big mess. But it is interesting to watch it. This is it, and you'll see it's very different uh, in its feel, in its communication, compared to the three campaigns we've just seen before. It just smells of advertising, smells fake, smells of the advertising I used to watch when I was at school. Um, and really, you know, times have moved on a long way since then. You can see this particular ad uh, was a total and utter failure. You can see by looking at it. Um, when I, it's, it's a shame I can't see you because sometimes when I presented this ad um, in class at Britannica, I've had a few people look at me and go, but Mike, you don't get it. Why? What's wrong with it? It kind of looks cool. Um, but the thing to understand is that all the demonstration, all the apparent social activity um, that was going on in that commercial was just a commercial, it was totally fake. Um, and the whole sentiment uh, and the way that the thing was filled was very much uh, sort of quite voyeuristic. It had no real heart or soul. Um, and they paid, it was, it was basically pulled to pieces uh, by consumers. And uh, 
text, you were embarrassed uh, and had to make a huge apology. Now, it's interesting to see, um, you know, we may think that, um, you know, that a lot of these cases are brought from outside of, outside of Russia, and you can go, well, I know Russia's different. Um, and I, no, I hear that a lot, uh, uh, particularly at work, actually, uh, working in an advertising agency. And there is true, there is, there is Moscow and there's the rest of Russia, uh, and there are different sort of behavioral um, uh, types within different uh, areas of Russia. But things are changing, um, and particularly in Moscow, uh, which is a, a, a force in Russia and a force in the world. Um, and Moscow, uh, in a recent world survey, which we were looking at last summer, is actually the sixth city uh, in the world in terms of uh, a, a range of different factors um, it came sick and in fact in terms of infrastructure it actually was in first place but infrastructure means things like communications uh, transport um, uh, access to wi-fi all that sort of stuff so in terms of that actually beat all other cities in the world so moscow is is a very dynamic metropolis and things are changing and I speak to uh, friends who are at Deloitte and uh, a big consultancy firm uh, a couple of months ago. Um, and they were saying that, in fact, a lot of these things that I've been talking about, they do see uh, uh, with the younger members uh, of staff who have joined. And, and, and Deloitte is, is, a, you know, is a world consultancy uh, company, um, which you would have thought would normally employ people who are more concerned about big salaries and power but apparently not a lot of the younger generation that are joining are actually uh, less interested in money to the extent that my friends are saying there is a mismatch now between the senior partners and the younger members of staff um, who seem to have completely different uh, world uh, outlooks and values so it's, this is interesting these, these things are hugely relevant these changes are happening uh, here and everywhere around the world and this takes me on nicely to um, um, uh, to my to my next group of people, creativity is synonymous with Generation uh, Z. So Generation Z have been around since ninety seven. So most of the oldest is now twenty three. They're growing up fast, um, and um, they are actually getting wealthier and more powerful as a group. And it takes years time. They are going to be one of the most powerful consumer groups. Um, in fact, they are going to be the most powerful consumer groups. So they are, in fact, uh, a force to be reckoned with. Um, not only that, uh, but they're also a very active group. So we all know uh, Greta. Uh, you know, you, you can love her, you can hate her, uh, but you can't ignore her. Um, and uh, not only is the Greta, but Greta actually is really the tip of the iceberg. There are lots of Greta's around. Um, uh, not as big and not as famous, um, but there are many, many uh, people in generations of teenagers, um, people of a similar age who are actually going out and doing incredible things and actually holding the older generations, my generation, to account. You know, what have you done with the world? Uh, why have you screwed it up for us? Um, you know, we need to start getting serious about sustainability, recycling, about energy, all these things. So this is a really, really dynamic um, a group of people. And we can pull out lots. I mean, there's Emma Gonzalez, who was very big uh, on gun control in the United States after a space of school killings. Um, and there are many others. Uh, Marla actually is a little older. Um, she doesn't quite, she's kind of on the edge of Generation Z. Actually, is, uh, she is actually just Generation Z. She's famous uh, for working. Uh, in Pakistan for education for women. And she became famous because she was shot at point blank uh, by the uh, Taliban on her way to school, um, uh, sort of about six or seven years ago. She was shot in the face and somehow survived uh, miraculously um, and has now gone on to become a, a United Nations um, uh, diplomat um, and now works around the world uh, and is a force for change, um, helping women to get access to education. So these, this, is, this is the new generation of highly motivated, tough uh, individuals who are getting a lot done. Um, and this is kind of 
uh, the world we're in. At the same time, we kind of have less trust in institutions, the media, uh, and brands. Um, if you look at Britain, um, there's much less trust in, in, in parliaments as a result of things like Brexit. Um, and people are much more willing to trust uh, their communities, uh, their friends, uh, and influencers and bloggers and people like that, and experts, uh, rather than the old big institutions of the past. There's quite an interesting article that was written by Yulia uh, Udovenko from Publicis Group, she's a, 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 a very good um, uh, strateg there, uh, talking about the way that uh, people now relate to brands. And some of the findings that she had is the history of the brand has depreciated, now only 28% of 18 clinical has indicated uh, its importance. Um, and in fact, what we need to really say is uh, generations that are very discerning about their brands, not so much they're disloyal, it's like they really want to know uh, what brands stand for and that brands take action. Um, and uh, a lot of this group, they turn to family members, friends, experts and colleagues uh, in order to get um, recommendations about what they should be uh, buying. So this is kind of, I'm coming to the end of my first part, which is how change has changed. And very interesting, I just love this uh, particular visual, which actually was a, uh, a visual showing uh, global warming. And as you can see, the red bits are the hot bits and the blue bits are the cold bits. But you can see how um, even global warming, the, 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 the change or has changed, the way it changed is now much, much quicker. We see since 2000, it's kind of gone mental uh, with uh, the um, temperatures going up much higher um, and going into much darker rates in the last three or four years. So you see now it really is um, changing and changing fast. That was uh, part one. Uh, uh, part two, we're going to look at how does creativity help? Okay, so everything's changing. Um, so how is creativity going to help us with that? Um, now essentially, if we look at uh, the skills that are needed for work in uh, 2020 compared with the skills needed for work five years ago, you could see a massive change. Um, creativity was in 10th place back uh, five years ago, kind of at the bottom of the list. Um, and now uh, it's in third place, yeah? Um, a massive hike in seven places just in five years. Uh, and this has come from the World Economic Forum. So you see creativity uh, is now seen by employers um, and companies as key uh, to basically the future and making sense of a world that's changing very, very fast. And of course, um, we live in, in COVID times now, um, and more than ever, we've had to see companies think creatively in order to adapt and change uh, to the new reality of living in lockdown or not being able to shop or have social distance, not being able to travel. Um, and some companies have been very creative, some have kind of lost the way a bit. But creativity is, is really key. Um, what's very interesting is that the, um, uh, this guy, Ken Robinson, Sir Ken Robinson, uh, who's a famous educationalist in the United Kingdom and also around the world. He's a great speaker. Uh, if you get the chance, do look at his TED talk. Um, and he says that creativity now is as important in education as literacy, and we should treat it with the same status. So schools, as I remember them, uh, and I think to a certain extent, still as they are today. Um, it's all about literacy, it's about maths. Things like creativity in music or in uh, dance or in art, those things are seen to be somehow less serious. You know, you need to read first and do maths. And, um, and then when there's time, then we can start doing art and music. But he actually said no. Really creativity is as important as learning to read uh, and as learning uh, to do maths. And it should never be treated as a second. And what's interesting, he says, you know, where did this come from? How is it that maths and reading 
uh, have become the first place in in schools and and that somehow art and music is seen as something nice to have or is, as a sort of additional extra um, and he identified it with public education uh, which was developed in the 19th century um, a couple of centuries ago um, and education basically was developed back then to meet the needs of industrialism as the world changed um, and industry sprung up we needed people who were good with numbers and reading um, to basically uh, uh, to be able to basically take charge of uh, the massive kind of industrial revolution that went on around the world. The things have moved since then, um, but some education uh, has not yet quite adjusted uh, to the needs of uh, seeing creativity as key as key as anything else. There's a lovely story that, that uh, Sir Ken Robertson tells of this woman called Gillian Lyne, who's famous in the UK, a very famous choreographer, she was a dancer. Um, when she was at school, she basically uh, didn't do very well. She couldn't sit still. She couldn't concentrate, she was distracted. And she was such a problem um, that on one occasion, the headmaster of her school uh, called her parents to the school and said, you know, we have a problem with your with your daughter. Uh, basically, we can't teach her. I mean, she's just uh, not able to sit and concentrate uh, and do classes. Um, but this headmaster was very clever. He wasn't the usual kind of headmaster who might have said, look, she's got a mental problem. She needs to go to the institution. He said, look, he said, I, I want to show you something. So what he did is he said, um, he said to uh, Gillian, who's a little girl uh, who was in the meeting with the parents, the headmaster said to her, he said, I'm just going to go outside and I, with your parents. I'm going to leave you in this room and we'll be back in a few minutes. So just stay here. Um, we will uh, return. And as they went out of the room, leaving the young Gillian behind, the headmaster switched on the music and then left and closed the door. Um, and then the headmaster said to the parents, said, look, look, look through the window, look at your daughter. Um, and immediately the music had been turned on. She started to dance and move uh, and do incredible things. And the headmaster said, look, he says, she has something special that we cannot uh, teach or understand at this school. You need to take her from this school uh, and give her to be taught by people who understand uh, this gift that she has, because it is remarkable. Um, and as a result, she was taken from that school, sent to special dancing schools. Um, and then she went on to become a very, very famous uh, dancer in the UK and choreographer. And she wrote all the choreography for Andrew Lloyd Webber's big musicals like Cats, Phantom of the Opera, um, uh, Starlight Express, uh, and went on to be uh, a millionaire, very, very successful. And that's amazing. You know, at school, you know, just because one smart headmaster had been able to see that she was creative, um, basically her future was saved. In some other schools, she may have been sent to a mental institution or just given medicine. So that's very interesting how uh, we need to really understand creativity. Um, and uh, uh, creativity, how else it, it, we need it and why it's, uh, it's key um, and can help us cope uh, with all this change. It, it actually challenges us to explore and to make new connections. You know, we have often think that you know, science looks like formulas and art looks like pictures. Um, but actually, if you look at uh, both these two people, Einstein and, and Leonardo da Vinci, you can also switch, switch them around. Um, Leonardo da Vinci actually was very scientific. And he was known for his inventions. He saw drawing as a scientific investigation. Um, and in many ways, uh, writing formulas is a form of uh, drawing process in which you try to investigate uh, the possibilities uh, that surround a particular um, uh, situation. It's not different from just drawing um, uh, uh, as an artist does. And if you look at you know, this uh, beautiful building down in, in Baku, by Zaha Hadid, famous architect, uh, who unfortunately died a few years ago um, uh, at a far too young an age. Uh, you can see how 
um, this beautiful building in a way sort of combines art and science. It's beautiful and fluid, and yet it's it's science that uh, keeps it standing uh, and makes it a physical reality. But it's informed, its shape, its its fluid nature is informed by art. So we need to sort of break away from uh, these uh, old ideas of the way that uh, that creativity is in a box, uh, and we need to use it. Uh, to help us make sense of a changing world. And interestingly enough, um, Snapchat, you all know Snapchat. Um, it's uh, owned by a guy called Evan Spiegel, very wealthy, he's also very young. Um, and he uh, is an IT schnick. He's basically an, I, uh, an IT, um, he um, created a very, very clever uh, platform. Um, but in any meeting they have, they all, uh, sit around the table with piles of paper and a pencil each and he wants people to draw he wants them to express their ideas on paper to draw things out the drawing is a huge part of the working process at um, snapchat jessica walsh she's a, a, a great designer from new york check her out she does some great stuff she's got a lovely instagram um, she i think is very very lively uh, uh, she's a classic creative and also uses drawing in very interesting uh, ways, often drawing in unusual places like on people's faces. Um, and often you can look at a system and you can challenge it. It's like how can we creatively change uh, a system that we take for granted? Um, how can we use creativity to make it better? It's a nice little case where, um, you know, why, 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 why do we always think that pedestrian crossings are just in black and white? Because it's kind of the simplest. Uh, option is paint white lines. But what happens if we begin to ask questions um, and actually use creativity to perhaps improve that? Uh, they did these various uh, pedestrian crossings, I believe they're in Spain somewhere, uh, by actually making them brighter. It encouraged drivers to help drivers to see the pedestrian crossings, made them more visible. Uh, it encouraged um, uh, pedestrians to actually walk on the pedestrian crossing rather than at other places down the road. Um, and as a result, they actually uh, had, I believe, a reduction in accidents um, and deaths, actually making the place safer. So you could say, well, it probably costs more to paint a colourful pedestrian crossing compared to a black and white one. Yes, it would be. But actually the savings are um, probably greater when you uh, basically adjust for the fact that you have not to um, uh, help, uh, you actually help less injured people um, in terms of uh, uh, using rescue services uh, and saving people who've had accidents on the road. So um, this is an idea, a place where creativity can actually help uh, produce a sort of better result and actually makes better, actually makes better business sense. Um, and um, also, importantly, creativity helps us have empathy with others, and empathy is very important to understanding the condition that others are in, to listening and understanding the needs that they have. As the world changes fast, uh, we need to be able to understand what other people need. Um, there was a great exhibition at Garage uh, about, um, uh, about, about a couple of years ago, um, which was Instruments for the Deaf. Who would ever have guessed that you could create a musical instrument for the deaf? And that very much uh, challenges our sort of sets of belief about the deaf just being deaf. And in fact, um, uh, these instruments work in different ways. They physically change uh, the air, they resonate, they make uh, sounds, they shake, they vibrate, and do a bunch of other stuff. And those things can actually be felt by uh, people who uh, are deaf. They can actually hear in non-conventional ways. Uh, they have other abilities. And this is very interesting. Um, creativity opens us up to new possibilities uh, with people who we uh, perhaps have not uh, understood um, have uh, different sets of abilities. Um, so, you know, are they disabled? Are they enabled? This is very much like the IKEA case that I showed you, uh, where basically you could do so much for um, disabled people in simple ways. Um, Another very interesting uh, fact is that blind people actually love cinema. Who would ever have thought that? Um, they go and they experience uh, cinema through sound and feeling. They can't see it, but they can hear it. Uh, and also 
the cinema experience is as much about being together in a collective in a cinema as it is about actually viewing the film. So um, and this guy here, uh, actually Tommy Edison, is, is actually a blind film critic. Now, who'd have believed that actually there are critics uh, for, who are blind and write about film for other uh, blind people? So again, this creativity helps us see uh, the world in, in new lights and open up new possibilities. Um, also, blind people um, have seen it in Moscow now. They've had it in Paris, but it's now appearing in some of the Moscow museums. It's actually recreating art in a three uh, the in a voluminous form that blind people can touch uh, and feel uh, and it gives them an experience of art that's different from the way people with vision would experience it but is nonetheless uh, an experience of art and they're as ready for that uh, as anybody else um, and uh, I think I'm going to move over this one to getting short in time um, and uh, creativity also makes us uh, question the status quo um, you know, what, what exists, how can we make it better? Um, so this is particular uh, of business leaders in the last sort of 10, 15 years, um, the creative ones who have challenged and disrupted entire business models uh, who have changed the world. So by being creative, they've actually asked, you know, are there better ways to move around a city other than a taxi? And what has been invented, you get things like Uber. Um, can we fund uh, a business without going to the bank? You know, we end up with things like Kickstarter. Um, you know, YouTube, can we share videos with people um, through a sort of a, a cloud-based platform? We end up with YouTube. Spotify, can we redefine the way that we listen to music? Um, so these are very people, creative people who've asked uh, questions. And in my last section, which we'll come to, Asking questions is a very important part of how you yourself can find yourself being more creative uh, in your uh, everyday lives. Um, uh, and also, there's a, there's a lot we can do uh, with, with data as well. I'm going to show you a couple of cases uh, here um, because obviously the data environment is, is, is key and is very significant uh, in the world around us um, and more and more making an impression. Data um, is uh, uh, an interesting thing that we can use creativity, creatively and delve into, um, create all sorts of new connections. I love this particular case, which was written for German Railways, um, with a very creative idea, but using data in a very clever way. So you need to have a good creative thinking, but very good programming and coding skills to make something like this work. ourselves, how can we bring even more relevance and attention to each comparison? First, we developed an algorithm that searches for look-alike photographs. Through Facebook data, we found travel enthusiasts like Lucas, who are interested in specific destinations. Geotargeting pinpoints Lucas' current location, and the closest airport. Another algorithm finds the destination airport. The search engine identifies the cheapest flight price for Lucas in real time. A unique social media price comparison.
That's a, a beautiful, beautiful case. Um, genius. So he's trying to get people to travel within Germany more and not to go to expensive faraway destinations by showing them they can find the same place um, in Germany. It's actually a genius idea. But then also actually looking, writing enough code uh, and actually creating algorithms that can basically search uh, destinations uh, locally in Germany that, that actually look the same as the places that you are planning to go to. If you're looking for a holiday uh, in Bali, it will find you something uh, close by in Germany to go and visit. It's just genius. Um, and this, this is important, but we need to be creative in the way that we look at data and be able to find interesting ways of using it because it is uh, sort of part of our uh, landscape of the future. This is an interesting case. This actually is an art project uh, which was uh, used, uh, created by a Turkish artist who uses data from the Bosphorus. Uh, it's weather data. Um, and he creates a visual rendition that kind of looks like waves, but it's kind of digital. It's in a huge installation that was like seven or eight meters long by two meters high on this massive screen. And it kind of looks like, uh, kind of looks like this. Very sort of hypnotic. Um, it's just a work of art, but it's a data work of art. And we're going to see more and more of this as um, uh, artists see data as something that we can use to create with. Um, this range is quite mesmerizing. It was a beautiful installation. Uh, and people would stand there and just kind of watch this thing kind of move for, for hours. Um, and again, uh, I think I'm going to skip over. This is another nice campaign, again, using data, an interesting way, a bit like the German campaign, but a, a different uh, set of data inputs and a, a, a different uh, uh, result. Uh, this particular campaign analyzed, it was for a, a drink brand, analyzed your friends uh, on your social media and how long that you spend with them. Uh, and as a result of understanding how long you spend with them in the past, it would predict how long in the future you had to spend with them. And actually the results were very, very uh, startling, a very clever idea. Um, so it would say that, you know, I see maybe my brother in the UK, maybe twice a year for a couple of days. So basically it would, it would work out, okay, if you see him for five or six days a year, you're only going to see him for another 80 days for the rest of your life, which is quite scary when you, think about it. Um, it was a very clever campaign, um, and, uh, but we don't have time to show you the whole case, so I need to move on a bit. Um, so, yeah, so basically, we, just to conclude, uh, the, the, the second uh, uh, section um, here, um, how does creative help? Um, it helps us really look uh, deeper into things to see what we have in common. Um, and I love this quote, we should look for what we have in common, but we should fall in love with what is different. Uh, and I think creativity helps us achieve that. Now, at section three, um, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, the conclusion, the world is changing so rapidly um, that we must use creative abilities to find solutions. And creative is a resource in all of us. And we'll talk about that in section four. Section three is quite quick, the economic case. Uh, we can't really talk about creativity without putting some numbers behind it. And it's very interesting. Uh, I want to talk to you a bit about the story of orange. What is orange? Orange is a um, basically a very clever report that was put together by um, this man, Ivan uh, Marquez, who was at the um, World Development Bank. And he was a banker uh, and he had a clever idea. He, he wanted to analyze creativity um, and he put a whole set of figures and numbers behind it. He did it specifically for Latin America because he was based uh, in Latin America. Uh, and he basically said there was infinite opportunity by, create, by developing creativity and the creative industries. Uh, and he, he put a very scientific report together with a lot of uh, numbers and figures. Um, and it became a very famous analysis uh, and one of the most popular reports at the um, Central Development Bank. Uh, he then, um, as a banker, 
actually went on to become the president uh, of uh, Colombia. Uh, and uh, as the president, he actually decided to um, basically take his, his theory that he developed as a banker and put it into action. Um, and it's interesting, you, when you think, what does Colombia make? Yeah, a lot of people answer this question. They say, oh, we make drugs. Um, yeah, there's a lot of that. But actually, the, 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 what they mainly do is, uh, the, the official answer is they do coffee and mining, right? Um, and, but with uh, this initiative of creating the orange economy, which is basically the same as the creative industries, now uh, the creative industries in Colombia are actually worth more than coffee and mining, which is amazing uh, uh, and a big, big change. And people don't talk about it enough, really, because it's an amazing thing um, that uh, this guy uh, who was a banker became a president uh, and took his ideas and then actually made them happen and has transformed uh, the economy of Colombia. Um, and it's begun to you know, get attention from serious people like Forbes, um, who are saying that uh, innovation, creativity, intellectual property rights, um, can the orange economy save Colombia? Things like intellectual property rights, interestingly enough, Colombia was a basket case, uh, with like 150 on the uh, intellectual property rights list uh, of uh, abusers, um, which meant that companies like Netflix didn't want to do business in Colombia because it, you know, it's like, if you go there, they'll just steal everything. Um, but in the last sort of four or five years, Colombia has gone up from like 150 to like 30 or 40, 30, which is a huge change and um, is, you know, it doesn't make them the best, but it makes them uh, good enough for people like Netflix to go, oh, well, now property rights are more important. Um, in Colombia than they used to be, um, and actually we can start doing business uh, in uh, Colombia and start making content there, start sharing uh, our platform there. So you can see how um, there's this amazingly virtuous uh, effect. And if we look at like first world countries, um, uh, uh, people like a place like the UK, um, the creative industries are actually growing at something like five times faster than other industries. So it's massive. So basically creativity can turn around entire economies, bring real change to society, improve quality of life and stimulate innovation. So with creativity goes a massive uh, 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 host of benefits. Um, and la the last section, section four, uh, my creativity. How can I or how can we be more creative now this is a, a big section and really we could talk about this um, as an entire presentation on its own. And there are many different models here. Um, and if you're interested uh, in this, then you know, let us know, we can actually make this into a separate workshop. Um, to do this in 10 minutes is, is quite a challenge. Um, but there's some ideas here, which I hope can help you think more about how to be creative and show you a few examples of people who have done that, some quite famous people. Um, so creativity first and foremost, creativity is not a mystery. There are proven techniques for enhancing creativity and they are within everyone's reach. Right? So all of us can do creativity, it's really up to us to want to do it. And this guy, Keith Sawyer, has created a very interesting system uh, uh, for being more uh, uh, creative. Um, and he um, uh, he calls it the eight steps to creativity. Um, and uh, he, wherever you look basically in the creative world, there's always, a, there's, this list of eight is always there somewhere. He sort of created a sort of an easy step, of kind of like ask, learn, look, play, think, fuse, choose, and make. Now this, the list seems very long, but actually all aspects of creativity kind of uh, will use one or more parts of that. Maybe you won't use all eight, uh, but if you have that in the back of your head, it's a good place to start. And I think the first part is asking questions. And I have said that earlier on in the presentation, that, you know, to start getting good at creativity, you need to ask good questions. You know, like the pedestrian crossing, black and white, ask the question, 
is this the best type of pedestrian crossing? Can we make it safer? Can we save lives? Can we actually make it more joyous to look at uh, in the environment than simple black and white? So always start with a good question. If we, if we break down these eight steps, I mean, this is, we should take, we should take sort of 50 minutes or 10 minutes with each of these steps and I have to race through it now, but yeah, you know, the right questions uh, lead to novel answers. Um, learn, you know, prepare your mind with, for constant creativity. So you need to be involved in creative, you know, get involved in going to see things that you like. Maybe it's an exhibition. Uh, uh, maybe it's something outdoors, maybe it's a concert, um, but get involved in the creative world somehow. Maybe you go to plays, maybe you watch movies, right? So be, be exposing your mind to creativity in any form. Look, you know, be aware of, of, of the answers all around you. Use fresh eyes, you know? You may see things that you hadn't seen before. Things may appear where you didn't expect them. We will talk a bit about some of the inventions that have happened unexpectedly because people just opened their eyes. Play, play is important. People think it's kids stuff, it's not. Play is crucial because um, it frees your mind to imagine possible new worlds. Kids do it all the time. And somehow when we grow up, we seem to think that we need to stop playing, but actually playing is important. Um, and a lot of you will play. Probably you have games, you may play uh, with your friends, perhaps um, perhaps during quarantine. Um, uh, or, or typically drinking game is a big English thing. Uh, so there is a bit of play in people's lives. That sort of spirit needs to be out there uh, everywhere uh, at all times. Think, have more ideas uh, than you'll ever need. Um, ideate is the key. This is a big one actually, and it's difficult uh, to explain it quickly, but um, basically the key to having lots of ideas is quantity, right? You need to kind of generate ideas, generate ideas, generate ideas, and then some of them will be good. Interestingly, Einstein um, I, uh, wrote 240 scientific papers. How many of those do you remember, right? You remember a couple of the famous ones, like relativity, um, uh, but the other sort of 230 or so, who knows what they were. Um, fuse, it, fuse is it really is crucial. You get new ideas by joining old ones, yeah? Um, think about, for example, uh, uh, sh uh, the, um, the Incredibles, which is my backdrop. Uh, I love The Incredibles. Um, what have they done? They've taken the idea of a regular family and combined it with superhero uh, abilities. Yeah, and that's a great, you create something new, right? a whole great new idea, a family of superheroes who are sort of bitching and bickering about family things while saving the world. Yeah, so remember, fusing, combining ideas, Choose, always have to choose ideas, edit, throw out the bad stuff, and then you've got to get on and make it, yeah? And then that comes to execution. You've got to draw it, write it, compose it, build it, sing it, act it. Um, and, then it then, and then you often have creative ideas about how you execute. But that is a good structure, and Sawyer has produced uh, some good books on this, uh, and I think it is a great way of getting into creativity. Now, the better question, here's an example, you know, ask better questions. For example, how can I build a better mousetrap? But you maybe need to ask a different question. How do I get the, the mouse out of my house? Perhaps, how can I make my backyard more attractive to a house than my house? Yeah, so new questions may help you look at the problem with fresh eyes. Rather than trying to just build a better trap for killing mice, you may be a different way of solving the problem. Um, uh, this is a great case, I'm gonna skip it now, where they had a problem with uh, trying to do health messages on Facebook because it's illegal uh, to show breasts on Facebook. So you can't do health messages um, about uh, self-checking and cancer checks. So what they do is they put a man in instead um, and, uh, and, and that was legal. So they got the message over uh, that way. But I will share it to you, it's a great case. Women's boobs, particularly their nipples, are censored in certain social networks even when showing it how to perform breast self-examinations to detect early breast cancer. But we found boobs that aren't censored. Henry's. Hello, let's begin. Standing in front of a mirror, place your hands on your hips. Check your breasts for any changes in skin or nipples including swelling, redness or lumps. Then, hands on your head, check for shape distortion. Now, time to get active. Your 
three middle fingers press in a spiral from your armpit downward, going under the breast and covering its entire surface up to the nipple. Don't forget the armpit and upper pecs. If you feel any lump or irregularity, contact your gynecologist. There are three steps to detect breast cancer. Breast self-examination, visiting your gynecologist regularly, getting a mammogram. That goes for you too, Henry. Men can also contract breast cancer. Thank goodness that doesn't go for censorship. Share this video or make your own. All you need is a pair of man boobs. So you see a nice, a nice idea applying that same thing of questioning, you know, do we need to show a woman in order to do uh, a health, uh, public health announcement? Perhaps we can use, uh, perhaps we can use a man instead. Uh, and they get the same message over and do it in a really humorous and kind of memorable way for a message that would normally be actually kind of rather tedious. Um, but again, using, using creativity and asking questions. Um, Common pitfalls, uh, yeah, so watch out. Thinking there is only one great answer out there. No, there are many great answers out there. Um, and you can often tell stories in different ways. Uh, and often they can be as valid as each other. Um, and thinking you only need to be creative occasionally. Again, creativity is something we need to employ uh, all the time. We need to get into the habit of being creative. Um, there's another set of tools. I talked about the eight stages. There's another group of people um, who we use in advertising. So this is more specific to advertising um, and it's a particular methodology for being creative, which actually is really clever. Um, we use it, uh, I know colleagues who use it, but it, it's interesting to show how um, with the right tools, we can unlock um, uh, our creativity. Um, and, Again, there are, I think there are 12, 11 or 9, um, 10 different tools here that these guys uh, use and teach um, in order to open up creative thinking. Um, things like, you know, create a product or dynamic connection, new tasking, blah, 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 down to sabotage. But each of these needs an explanation. They do workshops on these and it's very interesting. But I'll just show you one. I'll show you sabotage. Um, sabotage is a very interesting approach to a problem or to a brand um, and in fact here's one connected with uh, the COVID uh, uh, um, situation, the, the COVID um, epidemic. It's a, a nice piece of communication from Burger King uh, and what they've done is we all know we need to social distance, we need to keep two meters away from each other. So they've actually created a social distancing whopper burger, right? Um, and what they've done is they've sabotaged uh, their existing Whopper. They've sabotaged it. They've kind of like sort of broken it in a way by putting in uh, loads and loads of onions. Yeah, triple onions. What does that do? It makes you unpopular because it gives you bad breath, right? So the result of that is that, you know, with your bad breath, no one will want to stand nearby you. Um, so it's the Whopper that keeps others away from it. It's a fun idea. Uh, it's a bit crazy. Um, and it's where they've actually, in a way, made their product worse um, in order to actually uh, to create a very interesting communication that is very much connected with uh, social distancing and with the, the day, the times that we live in now. So it's a great, it's a great idea. And that's, that's one of those tools. You see sabotage, there's nine others. And you can do that with, 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 with other brands. You can actually you know, think, how do we fight for a cause? Or how do we relocate? Or what is a new task we can do? Um, so these are ways, again, that that's a particular methodology. Um, I think uh, if you're not in advertising, I think the first one I showed you is better uh, with, the, with the nine, the eight steps. Um, uh, and this, this is a, a quite a complicated quote but it comes from these guys. It's like, we need to overcome a mental block called structural fixedness, in which our minds perceive systems as a whole, making it hard to reimagine components. Basically what it says is we get locked into thinking in a certain way. You need to break that uh, perception by using creativity to think in different new, fresh ways, to ask questions, see problems, try and have lots of ideas, combine old ideas in order to be more creative. Um, or, uh, uh, read broadly and explore. If you stay too close to your subject area, you will end up copying everyone else. Yeah. So see everything as inspiration. Frankly, yeah. 
anything might spark a good idea. So don't just sit there and go, oh, I'm just going to read this. Just whatever you do, whatever you go, you may get something because you don't know what you don't know, all right? Uh, until you know. So um, be open to new things. Uh, creative people take, uh, take risks. That's a big thing. Uh, it's, it, it's something you know you have to do. So it probably doesn't feel like a risk to you. Um, this is a great campaign by Libress. Um, I, it's kind of crazy. Uh, Libress have taken on the stereotype uh, they, they produce uh, feminine hygiene uh, products, um, tampons, uh, etc., etc. Uh, and they hate the hip. They've taken on the hypocrisy of the advertising and media environment by creating very controversial advertising. You can see from this image. Um, and uh, they've. Uh, this is the third year. The, the years before uh, were similar, but they became most radical. Basically, the issue is to do with showing blood uh, in uh, menstrual uh, advertising. Uh, and they've taken issue and they said we should be able to do this. Um, they took a huge risk. Uh, I won't show this whole ad because it's short on time. Um, but the, the, the marketing director said at one point, she said, I'm going to lose my job uh, with this. Uh, uh, she was so kind of, uh, so controversial. Uh, about doing this advertising and she took a big risk and she went okay okay I'm gonna lose my job whatever whatever we're gonna do it because I believe in it uh, she didn't lose her job uh, she kind of became famous for doing something that was uh, incredibly radical uh, and very tough um, and we can look at serendipity I'm racing through my last few I've got about five more slides um, and because uh, I'm up at about 80 minutes and I need to stop um, serendipity Serendipity is a great English word, serendipity. It means to uh, stumble on something accidentally or to create something you weren't expecting. Um, and uh, uh, famously, penicillin was created unexpectedly. So again, that's, that list of eight is about looking, about seeing things. Maybe you'll find something you didn't expect. Uh, sticky notes, those three M, uh, they were also created unexpectedly. Kevlar which is that bulletproof uh, uh, clothing. Um, Viagra was also created uh, as a mistake. Um, it was, they were trying to create another medication of angina. Uh, various sweetening products like saccharin and sucralose also created, and many others. So again, creativity sometimes happens accidentally. So you've got to have your eyes and ears open and be ready uh, for something to change. Um, and this is, I think, one of my last couple of cases, a very interesting case, uh, a famous DC-10 plane crash. Actually, it's, it was back in 1989. Um, there, was a, there was an issue with the airplane. They had an explosion uh, and it became uncontrollable. Um, and the plane was still flying. It should not have landed because it was not possible for landing. Um, and flying, as we know, is all about very concrete procedures and rules and things. But this captain of the aeroplane uh, had um, on board some other pilots from his company. So he invited them all onto the flight deck. Uh, and he said, we have to find a way to land this aeroplane and do what is impossible. Um, so they were on the flight deck. Uh, there were, I think, four, uh, uh, four, four pilots um, and they brainstormed and they figured out a way to land a plane that was, that was uncontrollable. Um, and they did the impossible. Now, they, they, the landing wasn't good. Uh, it did crash land. Um, but actually, they saved, I think, about 60% of the people on board. Um, so as opposed to crashing and losing everybody, um, they creatively found a new way to land the airplane. Um, and actually, it's a brilliant case of, of a world where you would think you do not want to be creative. You want to be strict and stick to the rules. These guys came up with a new way to land the plane. Um, and so basically, scores of the people on board survived. And um, it, was, it, was, uh, uh, it was huge news because no one thought that they, they did the impossible, basically. Um, and uh, finally, again, fusion. We need to fuse. You find new ideas by connecting old ones. Steve Jobs, why are Apple computers so beautifully designed? Why are all our smartphones, uh, iPhones, 
uh, so elegant. Uh, why do all designers and film and creative people use um, Apple products uh, and not PC? Because Steve Jobs went uh, on a random um, course to learn about calligraphy and typography whilst he was at California University studying uh, computer science. He did one semester um, as an extra course learning about uh, typography, which changed everything. He fell in love with it. He thought it was beautiful. And he said, my computers will be able to do that. And my computers will also uh, have that feeling of design uh, uh, about them. So that was, again, a, a, a creative fusion of things coming together, which was basically the DNA for the, 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 the subsequent development for, for Apple. Um, and I'll play you one last uh, uh, film. This actually is one of the most famous ads. It's very bad quality, I'm afraid, because it's hard to find. Uh, but it sums up creativity. Uh, it's an ad for Apple. Here's to the crazy ones. The misfits. The rebels. The troublemakers. The round pegs and the square holes. The ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. Now, the only thing you can't do is ignore. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see them as the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world. So there we go. So that's that's uh, you know how can we all be creative? You know, by embodying these things in the spine, those people have basically have found ways of bringing creativity into their lives and actually making uh, the world, changing the world, making it a better place. Um, so there we go, creativity in the age of change. We've looked at uh, uh, how change changed. Uh, we've looked at why does creativity help us in a changing world. Um, uh, we've looked at the economic case for creativity. Um, and uh, we've looked at how can I be more creative. Um, some of those sections we could talk on for, for much longer. Uh, I have spoken now for about an hour and 20 minutes, uh, which is the allotted time. Uh, and if you have any questions, then uh, I believe we do that in chat. Thank you very much uh, for listening. Um, and if you've got any questions, um, then ask in the chat. Uh, and I will um, attempt to answer. Yeah, there's a question and answer, uh, question and answer section. Um, so we can do that. So I see uh, Serafima. Serafima, thank you for saying thank you. Good to know somebody's up. It's very difficult, actually, this system of giving a lecture where I cannot see you at all. Uh, I feel like I've just been talking to myself for the last um, hour uh, and a half. But it's good to know there are some people there. Um, and we have a moderator who uh, I am in constant connection with uh, through uh, chat. He tells me that uh, there were, were, I think, 60 or 70 of you out there somewhere. Um, so I hope, um, I hope you found that interesting. I hope you found it inspiring. I hope you found it, uh, uh, you can connect with your creativity uh, and help make the world uh, a better place and change it somehow. Uh, the number of social, yeah, uh, Mina, I've seen your case. Let me just going to go back. Um, it was 30%. Hang on, give me a second. Um, uh, so, So, uh, me, uh, me, I, I hope you're listening. Uh, so, in 2019, 
the numbers 22 uh, social uh, Grand Prix and eight commercial ones. And of course, I have no idea whether you, that, that answer got to you, but I assume it did. Uh, um, yes, I think we can make the presentation available. Um, you would need to speak to the, uh, the administrator about how we do that. Um, I'm happy to make it available and um, I will now put that question. Oh yes, we'll publish it on YouTube. So I've just had that from the admin. Uh, there is a recording. Uh, so this will be recorded. The recording of this will be uh, on YouTube. Thanks, Mina. Archum, uh, yeah, Archum, um, it, it's, yeah, it's commerce at the end of the day, there is always that. But I don't think we can say that if you have a commercial interest, that somehow it is at odds with a social cause. Um, so I think you have to be careful of saying they're hypocritical um, because they want money. I don't think that's the source of the hypocrisy. I think the hypocrisy is when you try to do one thing by pretending to do something else. So, so Pepsi um, um, is hypocritical because Pepsi was pretending uh, to be supporting a cause, they were showing a fake demonstration with people marching in the streets, which is quite clearly fake. Um, whereas IKEA is actually trying to make things better in a, in a genuine way for people with handicaps. And in fact, the person who invented uh, uh, those things in the video was themselves a handicapped uh, creative. Uh, actually, the person in the video uh, who demonstrated uh, all the features um, and sat on the sofa, that actually was the guy who created all those things. And he works in an agency in Tel Aviv. So I, I, I don't think I hear uh, 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 hypocritical. I think their heart's in the right place. Yes, they will make money, uh, but they're a business. Uh, I think that's where we have to be very clear that we, we can have business that is making money in a way that is line in line with the things um, uh, that we need to do uh, to make the world a cleaner, better, more social place. I, I don't think the two are at, at loggerheads. I think they're like that. Good question, Archon. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's, it's back to, and often you see it, we do see it in, in, sometimes in Russia, it's the, it's the zero sum thing, Artyom, where, where basically if I'm, if I'm winning, you have to lose, yeah, the zero sum game. That's not the case at all. It's win-win. It's where if I win, you win. We win together. We go, you know, together uh, and we, we both improve and we both benefit and we both uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, kind of, uh, succeed um uh, but yes I, it's, it's a good your point's a good one uh, and there is a mindset that is needed that needs to change and it is changing it is changing there is and as i'm talking to uh, mentioned deloitte um do have um and i thought i was actually very surprised um uh, uh i would not say happily surprised i think to hear that the younger people in deloitte are very much um the younger russian staff are very much uh, uh, concerned about values um, and, uh, and, and causes and action. Um, and actually the, the, the HR manager I was talking to at Deloitte said it's a problem because they now have these two groups of people in Deloitte um, who are the, the, the owners and the senior people who are quite different in values from the younger people. Uh, and also added to that, there's actually, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a now a, a very fast growing um, a social uh, causes, so well, the social causes are growing very fast in Russia in terms of money being given to them, supporting and things like this. I think it's actually very interesting 
Um, I, I don't have any figures to compare with the West or other markets, but it is very dynamic and it is changing. Good questions, Arthur. Thank you. Many thanks, guys, for, for listening. Uh, if you have any more questions, I guess we're we're here until um, until until the administrator shuts this down. Uh, I think um, the presentation uh, is going to be uh, online. It will be a YouTube video of this and the presentation that went before. Thank you, Natalie. That's very sweet. R I S D D D. What is that? Can you expand if you're still there? I'd love to know. I probably should know. I'm sure I should, but I can't look clear. That was a question to Natalie. I uh, got two questions in here. Uh, uh, Lamia, um, yeah, okay, it's, it's a fair question. Why is the Pepsi advertisement such a such a fail? Um, it's because it, it pretends to be supporting causes, but it's actually not. It's just uh, a kind of a film. Basically, um, people like Nike um, and Procter and Gamble have been supporting. Um, causes in the in the case of the of the athletes who wouldn't stand up. Uh, and uh, for Procter and Gamble, in terms of trying to redefine a new, uh, more healthy model of masculinity, both those brands have suffered. They've been trolled. They've taken uh, um, a media hit um, and been criticised. There were people who said, "What are you doing? You can't do that." Particularly Nike. Nike really badly. You even got the president Trump saying something. Um, but they've stood by it and they've gone, you know what, we believe in this and we're going to stand by our beliefs. Um, Pepsi didn't have to believe anything. They just made a, made a commercial with a story uh, of, a, of a protest, of a march, yeah, which is very fake. And this very sort of, very, the way it's filmed too, is very sort of, um, it has a very advertising kind of look, the way it observes, the way it films people. Uh, it basically makes everything look sexy and beautiful. Um, and the, the, when she goes up to the guys, the policeman, and gives them a Pepsi, which is actually a rip-off of that famous picture of a, of, um, a student putting a flower in a uh, American soldier's rifle at a student, famous student protest. I think it was in Chicago, some back in the 60s. Um, they all just spells fake, 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 um, and uh, it's not authentic, not genuine, and that's what a lot of the, the um, generations that really hate. It's like you know, you're just making a mockery of, of people who are genuinely trying to you know change the world for a better place. You're pretending to, but you're not actually changing anything. Um, so that, yeah. Uh, hang on, do you teach uh, at BH uh, uh, Britanka on how to bridge the gap between the generational perception? Um, I'm teaching te in, in, the, in the wider concept of marketing, yes, we do obviously talk about target audiences uh, and the way to communicate with different groups of people depending on uh, uh, the product or service uh, that you're doing. So yeah, we do and we look at segmentation as well, which to do with the psychological profiling of different consumers. Uh, and the way that they use products and services. So yes, that sort of does um, come in, our charm does come into uh, what we do too. Um, oh right, Rhode Island School of Design. Whoa, Rhode Island School of Design is very cool and very famous. So uh, respect, Natalie. Uh, that's quite a cool place. 
Um, and so you studied that. That's amazing. Um, that's great. Anna, Anna asked an interesting question. Anna says, um, thanks for your lecture, Mike. Do you have any personal tricks that you use personally to improve your creativity? Um, I think, I mean, for me, uh, I, so creativity has always just been part of life. Um, and uh, I think what I, one of the things for me actually is, uh, is the asking questions and learning. I, I, I find people very interesting. So I always love to ask people what they do and listen to their stories. Uh, so I find that um, is something that I find helps improve your creativity because there are so many people, I mean, people do the bizarrest, incredibest thing. Um, and the, the funny thing is I often find when, that when I listen to people, people aren't listened to enough, strangely enough. Um, and um, so that, that's one thing I do a lot. I also, I mean, I do all the lot of other things to talk about. I try and go massively to exhibitions and see uh, film and get out and about and see stuff. Um, uh, so I would, I would encourage that. But actually, I, I think listening to people is a great thing because you do get such insight. Um, uh, 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 so, uh, so, uh, um, mm, hang on, um, I've lost my place. Uh, anonymous, um, Hang on. Weaknesses of, um, uh, we've got a couple more questions here. Um, I'll tell, thank you for your book recommendation. Very interesting, Space Merchants, okay. I'm taking a screenshot of that, I'm gonna go and check it out. Um, anonymous, uh, that was our anonymous attendee. Um, what are the weaknesses of Russian advertising in your opinion? Um, Russian advertising has gone a long way, and uh, uh, from when I when I first came here back in the 90s, I mean we took about over 20 years. Uh, I, I mean I've got a, a selection of just the most. I, I mean they're so bad they are brilliant now. It's like one of those things where you know it, 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 when something gets to that end of the that end of the you know of the, of the kind of um, spectrum, it sort of comes back in at the other end, it becomes brilliant again, it sort of goes kind of full, full circle. Some of those ads in the 90s were just amazingly terrible. Um, but now it's come a long way, there's some really good advertising, I think. One of the weaknesses of Russian advertising, I think one of the things Russia still needs to learn is, um, I think a lot of clients still see their um, agencies and their uh, communication partners as suppliers, right? Which means it's a very vertical hierarchy, which means that, you know, a lot of clients will see their advertising agencies as people that they sort of taught, uh, tell them to do things or dictate to them. Uh, they don't see them enough as, as partners. The best advertising in the world happens with partnerships um, and, um, all everything that wins awards uh, in the Cannes Advertising Festival. If you look at the client relationship uh, with their agency, it's 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 like that. They 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 know each other well. They often work in each other's offices. That has yet to develop in Russia. It does happen in some cases. We have uh, a couple of clients actually that are kind of like that, and consequently, those clients get really good advertising and get great results. Um, uh, but that's something that the, the advertising, the kind of the communication and marketing industry in Russia kind of needs to learn uh, across the board. But there, there's a lot of great advertising coming out uh, in Russia now. And I've shown our ads, I've shown our Russian ads to London agencies, uh, and they've been saying, wow, that's really great stuff. A lot of great, a lot of good, I get a lot of comments actually about music and sound design, funnily enough, um, specifically singled out um, uh, some of our ads. Uh, there are a lot of great musicians in, 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 in Russia, and obviously Russia is famous for being incredible with music. Um, but that, that has often attracted particular comment when I've shown Russian advertising uh, 
in, in, in the United Kingdom. Um, uh, Tiam, uh, one of the weaknesses of Russian Amazon, a depressing question. What if I look at all those forces in terms of my face and I feel like I'll never be able to do something like that? Uh, well, I think, I think uh, anonymous attendee, I think your question, I think I've answered that question uh, kind of in a way, the weakness of Russian advertising. My answer it kind of also covers how are we going to, um, how are we going to make um, more uh, ads to, um, you know, to look like awesome trans Russian ads. Uh, I think it is about partnerships, but also I, I think, I think, you know, cans is one particular type of advertising as well. I think we need to be clear of that. They are great, totally agree, and they're awesome. But I don't think we should be so tied up that it's the be all and end all of everything. There are certain markets that do not perform well at cans. There are certain markets that do perform well at cans. So the British, the Americans, the Swedes, um, uh, uh, often the um, and a bunch of other companies do. Oh, of course, the Latin Americans do very well uh, at Cannes. Um, so there are a lot, there are a lot of advertising. The Japanese don't do particularly well at, at, at Cannes. And the Japanese advertising is on another, you know, is in another realm of its own. Uh, and Russian advertising doesn't perform very well. Um, so that's not to say that Russian advertising is rubbish. It's to say that Russian advertising doesn't actually really fit with what Cannes looking for, um, which is a shame uh, sometimes. Um, uh, some Russian advertising has done not badly there, um, not as much as we'd all wish, um, but sometimes I think we shouldn't get too, too, too heads up with that. Russian advertising tends to be a lot more emotional than stuff in the, in the, in, in the West. Um, there's a lot more sort of, uh, 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 tends to have more passion, which sometimes doesn't, you know, is less on, on big idea with Cannes love. So that's kind of one, one sort of mismatch slightly. Um, but I, th I think if clients and, and agencies worked better together, uh, I think that would also increase the number of, of uh, um, alliance. A University of Arts, uh, UAL, University of Arts, Jan, uh, interesting, which, 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 uh, which, which university, I mean, which campus, which, which part of UAL, it's a big place. Now, um, my son is at UAL as well. He's actually at uh, Chelsea College of Art. Uh, in fact, he's, uh, he's not, he's actually at home at the moment doing all his tutorials online. Uh, so yes, we all hope uh, that come uh, uh, September, October, that you will be back uh, there. Yeah, Jan, which, which UAL place? Um, uh, St. Martin, great place. I did my uh, MA at St. Martin's, Central St. Martin. Uh, what are you going to, uh, what are you going to uh, do there? What subject? Uh, I've got a question I missed up here. Um, uh, Artyom, why are these TV ads you showed so long? I've never seen any ads that long in Russia. Um, yeah, the, well, in fact, a lot of the stuff I showed you were case, case descriptors. So they were actually not so much ads um, as uh, cases that were um, describing what was done. Uh, they typically are two to four minutes. Um, so I had a lot more, um, but every time I show you one of those, it takes two to four minutes out of my available talking time. So I, I had to skip over a few. Um, obviously, there are uh, actually on longer uh, video formats, which are becoming more uh, regular now, uh, online video or OLV uh, typically can be a minute to four minutes. Um, so uh, in fact, we did some of the, a lot of that for Larder. Um, we did a, a short, short movie actually um, uh, last year. Um, that was all online video. So yeah, TV ads will typically be shorter, uh, but there are so many video formats now, particularly if you go onto digital platforms. 
Um, so when you say I've never seen uh, ads that long in Russia, um, on Russian TV, I agree. But if you go online, you will find a lot of Russian ads that are actually getting um, up to sort of a minute, a couple of minutes. Um, what else do we have? Fashion and arts and marketing. Okay, great. We have a great time in the arts. It's a fantastic place. London's exciting. Um, so let's keep our fingers crossed that, that everything is going to be um, going to be okay, and they're going to open up again. Uh, I think they will. Um, but the British are a little bit cautious. Uh, unfortunately, they're a little bit too safe conscious. But let's hope that they, they, they open up. Um, so, um, any more questions? I think we're going to stay here for a few more minutes if anyone wants to um, say anything else. I don't think I've I hope I haven't missed any questions. I'm just going back. I think I've got them all. Um, oh, John, there is, there is a, um, because uh, of the format of this, uh, I can't get, oh, can I? Uh, there, there, there's, um, uh, um, there's some good books actually on win-win. Um, uh, uh, John, yeah. Uh, because it is a bigger thing now in business about actually um, if we share, we both have a piece rather than I have it all and you have none. Uh, and there are some famous business books on this um, particular subject. So it, it is actually a bigger, a bigger trend uh, generally. So if there, if there, are, no, if there are no questions, um, uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll wind up um, here. And um, again, thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks for lots, for lots of good questions. Um, it was good to have so many of you. And I hope you enjoyed it, it was inspired. I'm excited to have had someone from, the, from Rhode Island School of Design and someone who's off to St. Martin's. That's really cool. And I wish you all uh, best of luck and bright futures. Um, uh, exciting creative adventures. Okay, so I think we're going to I think we're going to stop there. Uh, uh, what would you recommend to read? Ooh, gosh, um, fashion and arts and marketing. This uh, so much. Uh, marketing. Um, I actually have a list somewhere on the back of my computer, um, off the top of my head. Uh, there is, there is, there's, there's, in marketing, there's, there's some great advert, there's actually a great course book at um, the British, at Britanka, which we use for um, our level five students, but I can't remember the name. It's one of these long textbooks. Um, any other things to, to read in marketing? There's some, I some good advertising books uh, that I have because I'm better on advertising than on marketing generally. So if I would give you those, uh, there's um, Ogilvy. Ogilvy on, mark, on advertising is a great book. It's old. It's written in the 60s, so it's a bit dated, but the underlying principles are uh, actually really good. Uh, so that's Ogilvy on marketing. Uh, so, um, John Hegarty. Um, Hegarty is a British creative director who's a sort of institution, he's a sir, he's been knighted. Um, he is from kind of the 70s, 80s, uh, so he's, he's in his 60s now, does a lot of talking, he's really cool. 
Sir John Hegarty, any book by him is worth reading. Um, he has a book, I think, called On Creativity, um, which my students love a lot. It's a little yellow book, uh, sort of like that size. He has um, a, a bigger book on advertising, which I can't remember the name. It's, got, it's something like uh, Intelligence. Um, uh, in advertising is Intelligence or something like that. Um, but you can't, you can't miss it. It's orange. It's quite big. And that's a, a generally about advertising. Those are two great books um, on, uh, on advertising that I would um, uh, recommend. I think that's a help. Oh, and there's a good book, actually, Zigzag, I should say, on creativity. Um, Zigzag uh, is by um, the guy I referred to um, in, uh, earlier on in the uh, presentation. Um, this guy, The Eight Steps, uh, Keith Sawyer, he's written a book, actually, on those eight steps. So I've actually taken those eight steps from his book. Um, and it's actually really, really, uh, uh, you can explore those eight steps in greater depth. And it's actually, it's actually a really good book. Um, and he goes into each of these, each of these chapters. So that's Zigzag by uh, Keith Sawyer. And he specifically looks at creativity and how we can open it up. Um, so I would, I would hardly recommend that uh, book as well. There we go, three, three books. I hope that's a help. Um, So if you've got no more questions, uh, yeah, and I hope that was helpful. Um, recommendations. I think if we've got nothing else, um, we will wrap up there. So again, thanks guys. Thanks a lot. Uh, it was uh, great to have you all. Um, and. Uh, See you next time somewhere.